So we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3, as well as verses 19 through 21. So we're actually skipping a section in 1 Timothy 5, but we're not going to overlook it completely. We will come back to verses 4 through 18 at another time. So just today, though, let's take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the youngers as sisters with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. And uh, that's going into a whole new section there about the widows. And I wanted to tell you that's why we're skipping this section. It's a whole nother message all by itself. And I thought, God, how can I preach this message and the message on, window, on widows and do them both justice? And I just could not come to peace with that. So I'm separating the two. We'll have a separate message on widows and our responsibility as a church to the widows of our church at another time. Let's jump now to verse 19. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And uh, verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all that others may also fear. By the way, verse 20, them that sin, who do you think the them is? Not you guys, although I think it includes you. Specifically, what verse did we just talk about? Them who? Them the elders, which are who? The pastors. You know, a lot, a lot of times, we were talking about this in a little bit, a lot of times pastors get off the hook because they're pastors. Whereas uh, Paul is saying that's the complete opposite. The leader should have his he- feet held to the fire before anyone else. And if anyone deserves to be um, dealt with publicly, it's the leader of the church. You should actually be more lenient on the members of the church than you should on the leaders of the church. And if there is wrong that has been done to the church by a leader of the church, that leader needs to publicly apologize. And if they will not, then the church needs to publicly confront the leader on their unrepentant sin. Now, verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one another doing nothing by partiality. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this text and the clear uh, instruction you give us on how we should go about confrontation. Confrontation is a difficult thing to handle in the church. Oftentimes, we're not exactly sure if we should just deal with it, ignore it, run away from it, let it happen. And yet, your word is so clear, not just here, but in Corinthians, other texts that command us, not just encourage us, to keep your church pure. I pray that Meriden Hills Baptist Church would be a church that stands for truth and that challenges sin. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of this morning's message is Sin Challenge. Let me remind you that when you're dealing with confrontation, it should be the sin that is the challenge being challenged, not the sinner. All right? Here's the thing. If you really want to help someone overcome a wrong in their life, they have to know that you are trying to help them. If they don't believe you're trying to help them, they're going to push back against you. You say, well, Pastor Russ, in another passage of Scripture, God's Word gives us direction on what to do with people who push against us. If we confront them on their sin and they don't want to hear it, then we bring more people with us. And if they don't hear it with the group of people, then you keep doing it with more people. Eventually, you bring in the staff, the pastoral staff, the deacons. And if they just refuse and they keep pushing back against you, then finally... You enact enact church discipline, you bring them before the church, you say, look, this is a problem, this person will not get it right, they can no longer be members of this church. Yes, I know scripture gives us that instruction. My concern is this, I think a lot of times it is not so much the person pushing against um, correction, it is you basically pushing them out of the church. (laughs) And saying, uh, you know, I'm confronting you as a person, and you need to fix your life, and you are imperfect. And although those things are obviously true about all of us, we all are imperfect, and we all need to fix our lives in some sense with God's help. Really, if you want someone to have the best chance of success, you got to let them know that you care about them. And yes, while you are confronting them, you can debate semantics. Really, you want them to understand that what I'm trying to confront is the problem in your life, not so much you as a person. As a person, I love you. As a person, you're family. As a person, you're a child of God. But because of those reasons, because I love you, because you're family, because you're a child of God, 
you have to recognize that this sin is a problem. What can we do to help you get this sin out of your life? What can be done to give you victory over this sin? Because if you don't handle it in that way, all you're going to do is speed up the process of pushing them out of the church. Now look, I'm going to be honest with you. You can be the most compassionate person. You can have the best words in the conversation given to this person. They're still going to leave. That will happen with some people. I don't deny that. I would rather know, though, that when someone leaves, they left because they chose to not get something right, rather than in my mind thinking, you know what? I pushed them out of the church. I don't want to have that on my conscience. If they're not willing to get the, the, the sin corrected, then yes, at some point something has to happen. But don't let it be you pushing someone out prematurely. And especially who? Especially the church leaders. How many churches today are leaderless because they keep pushing their leaders out of the church? They keep confronting every minor sin. Now, I understand sin is a problem, and there's no such thing as in the sense of a minor sin. But let me tell you this, there are some sins that we should be able to say, look, you're not perfect, pastor, I get it. Let's work through these together. And there's some sins of like, wow, that's a big deal. Something has to be done about this, right? There, although all sins put Christ on the cross, and although all sins are, are, are horrible in the eyes of God, not all sins carry the same consequence on earth. You understand that? It is not right for you to put someone in life for pr uh, in, in prison for life because they they um, called you a bad name or because they said they hate you. That's that for me is not a life term prison sentence kind of sin. Whereas they kill someone, yeah, you deserve to be killed, be put to death, or go to prison for life. As far as I'm concerned, as far as the Bible is concerned, so we need to understand that God has different earthly consequences for sin, and so should we. Now. We do need to confront sin, though. Sin should be challenged. And I see here in this text, 1 Timothy chapter 5, I see the types of confrontation that we have are loving confrontation, we have righteous confrontation, and I think very important and often missed, unbiased confrontation. Loving, righteous, and unbiased confrontation must take place if we're going to challenge sin biblically in Meriden Hills Baptist Church. So let's take a look at verses really just one through two specifically uh, as we look at point number one, loving confrontation. The Bible says, rebuke not an elder. Now, an elder was actually a term that kind of had a dual meaning. It could mean just older people, or it could mean specifically a leader. Now, if you were an older person in the church, were you a leader? Not necessarily, although it would be assumed that those who've lived through life as a Christian longer than others— and have had the experience, would be someone you could look up to as an example. That should be assumed. But age itself does not mean you are now a pastor or a deacon or some type of spiritual leader in the church. It has to be, I think, other things involved as well. So elder in verse 1, I really believe, does include both of those meanings. Older folks as well as the pastor. And then we go on to uh, verse 1, continuing. And the younger as men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters with all purity. Okay, what do you see overall in this text of two verses? Letter A, respect is due the man who serves Christ and the church. Those who serve Christ deserve your respect, especially those who are serving Christ in the position of spiritual leader. In verse 1, if you are going to confront a spiritual leader, myself, one of my pastoral staff, and I would even include you know, like life group leaders, those that have been put in positions of spiritual leaders, but specifically pastors, please entreat that person. Don't rebuke them. Verse 1, rebuke not an elder, entreat an elder. What's the difference between rebuking and entreating? Rebuking has the idea of you are wrong, what is your problem, fix it, or you're out of here, or I'm out of here. This church ain't big enough for the both of us. That's rebuking. Basically, an attack upon the person is a rebuke. Entreating is an encouraging, imploring of someone to right their wrong. It is, look, you know I love you. You know I respect you. But you and I both know this is a problem. 
You and I both know that what you said to me the other day it was not appropriate. You and I both know that how you treated me was not helpful. It hurt me. We both know that. And I'm just asking as a brother in Christ, as a sister in Christ, I'm asking you, can we right this wrong together? Would you allow me and you to have a conversation to, to get this cleared so we can move forward in a loving relationship? You see the difference? One is an attack. The other is an encouragement towards righting the wrong. The Bible says, do not attack your pastor. Instead, encourage them to right the wrong like you would your own dad. Now, I don't know what kind of dad you guys have. My kind of dad, you wouldn't come out of a conversation attacking him um, with, with any kind of probably feeling good about yourself or him. Uh, my dad's a pretty strong personality. So my dad isn't going to let people rebuke him. You wouldn't get away with it. I would imagine a lot of you have a dad like that. You're like, I would never even have thought to rebuke my dad if I wanted to keep my, my two eyes in my head, right? Or my, my ears attached, you know, like smack you upside the head. Uh, so you wouldn't even fathom that idea of rebuking your dad. Now, maybe some of you did, and maybe some of you had a dad where you, where you did do that. It's not appropriate. I do believe, though, just because you have a father in your life doesn't mean that dad should get away with murder. doesn't mean that your dad should get away with, with any kind of physical or emotional abuse. And there are times where it's necessary to confront even your own father on a wrong that they've done you in your life. Especially if you're an adult. And now the relationship between you and, you and your father is really not the same anymore. I'm not saying he's, that man is not your daddy is, but the relationship changes, especially as an adult. You should have conversations with your dad about problems that have occurred in the past or now. But when you do, include honor and respect for the position that he has in your life, which is what? The position of fatherhood. He's your dad. Whether in your mind he was a good dad or not, it doesn't matter. He's your dad. Whether he was the perfect father or the imperfect father, doesn't matter. He is your father. And God says with that position requires a respect for who he is in your life. Now, I don't want to confuse you. I am not your dad. And to be quite honest, I don't want to be any of your guys' dad, okay? That's not a job that I want for my life. There are religions where the pastor, the priest, whatever the, the person calls himself, they want to be thought of as your dad. That's not this church. That's not this religion, okay? I'm not your dad. Don't call me your dad. Don't think of me as your dad. That would, like, weird me out for some of you guys to think of me as your dad. But, amen, that's right. But the Bible does not say to treat me like a father. It says to entreat me like a father, meaning in the same way you would encourage your dad, in the same honor you give your dad in this difficult conversation, that's what you should give me if this difficult conversation ever comes up between you and I. Now, there are many reasons why I love Meriden Hills Baptist Church. Let me tell you one of them. I've been confronted by members in our church, and almost every time I was confronted with the honor and respect to my position. There have been the rare times where I was rebuked and not entreated, and more often than not, it was from people who are not in our church but our school family. So in that kind of thing, I just like I let it go. Most of the time, the times that you guys have had issues with me, you've had concerns, you wanted to have a conversation, I was not disrespected, and I appreciate that. You know what it does for me? It makes me want to love you even more. You confronting me on a wrong in my life doesn't shock me, guys. I know, see, here's the thing. I know of more problems in my life than you know of problems in my life, okay? So when you come to me with a problem in my life, I'm just thinking, wow, I'm glad that's the only one you know about. I'm glad you don't know about all the other problems that I haven't told you about, okay? So you're not going to shock me, and I'm not going to be like, what? I have problems in my life? Where did that come from? That's not how I'm going to respond. I'm going to understand, you know what? Hey, my problems showed today. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I know I got problems, and I, and I thought these problems I've had in hand, and I thought that, you know, my decision-making was better, and if I made a mistake, I get it. I'm sorry. Let's work through this together. But when you come to me in a manner that's respectful, and you show me that you love me enough to confront me, I just love you even more, guys. Do not ever in this church for a moment be afraid to entreat me as a father. That will endear me to you. And nor should you be afraid to entreat my pastoral staff. Pastor Jimmy, Pastor Ethan, it should do the same. I know these guys are men of character. 
and they will not be upset with you. I really believe it will endear them to you when they see that you love them enough to do so. So letter A, give respect to the position of pastor. Letter B, the position of spiritual leader does not eliminate the need for accountability. <laughs> how many of you guys, don't raise your hand, but in your mind you can answer this. How many, how many of you have been to churches where it's basically either said or assumed that the leaders are not to be confronted? The leaders are not ever to be in a conversation where they are on the receiving side of some type of wrongdoing. You do that, you might as well just leave because once you do it, you are going to be leaving, right? Forcefully leaving. And that's just kind of the culture of the church. That is not biblical. If you're in that kind of church where it is said, stated, thought, or assumed, how dare you confront the pastor, that's not the kind of pastor you should want in your life. The Bible actually gives us times when you should confront the pastor when you should deal with the pastor because God knows this important truth. Pastors are people. Spiritual leaders are people. And if they're people, they have the same people problem that you've got. And what is that? The problem of sin. The moment a pastor believes that he is above the problem of sin is the moment you need to run or run that man out because that pastor is a lot deeper in sin than anyone can possibly imagine. No pastor on this earth will ever attain the level of perfection, which means I need to be held accountable, which means Pastor Jimmy and Pastor Ethan need to be held accountable. It means that all the spiritual leaders in this church, there needs to be accountability. That does not mean you're up all up in our business. It does mean when God has revealed an issue to you, you don't ignore it, and you go to the source. Some time ago, I would have to say it was about two years ago, I had to very uncomfortably bring a message to our church on gossiping. Our church was getting to a point where I was concerned how far we were going with gossiping, and people were talking to each other about issues rather than to the one they were really concerned about. And I remember very vividly bringing that message to the church and saying, look, this is, a, this is so important to me that as a pastor, I will enact church discipline on those who are gossiping and, and are not getting it right. And I want to tell you, I was so pleased with what I saw was the churn of our church. I, was, I, I recognized something you guys recognized, and that was, yeah, this is a problem. And a lot of our people, and I even had some come to me and say after, after the message, some came to me and say, Pastor Russ, I, I was part of that problem. I recognize that and I want to do better. And, you know, I th and I thank you. And they actually thanked me for giving that message. And they told me, I'm going to try to do better. I know this is an issue. I had more than one person do that. And that just thrilled my heart to know that our church received that kind of challenge in good faith. And that is basically what Paul is trying to keep from happening here. He's saying, look, there's going to be problems in your church. There's going to be times where you have to confront a pastor, an older woman, a younger woman, an older man, a younger man. Please, Confront them. Please entreat them. Stop talking about it amongst yourselves. All that is going to do is cause more problems and what will eventually lead in a very nasty exit from the church, either by one family, multiple families, all the families. It's not going to end well. The biblical response to sin is to challenge it with the person whose life the sin is involved, not to talk about it with other people who didn't even know about it to begin with. I'm not saying that now because I believe our church is back in a problem of gossip. I'm using it as an example. For many of you, you know and I know, we've already been through that. It does not go and end well. And I'm happy that our church is now coming out of that. It has been for some time. And now I'm encouraging you and myself, let's keep it going. Our church is not perfect. The people in it are not perfect. And when problems arise, can we be bold enough to entreat those whose lives the sin is within. Let her see. If we do not first view one another as family, we will not be effective in our efforts to confront sin. The Bible tells us in the gospel that before you go to someone and you deal with like a speck or a splinter in their eye, what should you do first? Yep, yank that log, that beam out of your own eye, right? Because you're not going to be effective going to someone with this massive issue in your life that you refuse to take care of and say, hey, you know that little minor problem that just keeps popping up? Man, that sure is annoying to me. I wish you'd get it fixed because I'm annoyed by you. And everyone else is thinking, wow, you're fortunate that you haven't been thrown out of the church because you got this big problem that we're patiently waiting for you to fix. 
You want to help people, you got to ask God to help you first. But not just that. If you really want people to listen to you, and you really want to entreat them as a family, there has to be some kind of family connection first. It would be very hard for you to come to them, create a family connection, and then right away turn around and now turn the conversation to confrontation. Because they're going to say, wait a second. So this whole like taking me out to coffee thing and you, you know, hugging me was just a ploy to get me to hear you out about my problems because I'm not having any of that. So look, invest in people before there's a problem so that when there's a problem, you can help them with it. We are family. Verse one, the elders as fathers, the younger as brethren, the women older as mothers, the younger as sisters, we are a family. So we cannot start thinking of each other as a family only when there's wrong in our lives. We have to think of a family, ourselves as a family now so that when the trials come, we can get each other through to the other side. So, number one, loving conversation, confrontation. Number two, righteous confrontation. Let's jump to verse 19 now. Righteous confrontation. Is there such a thing as right and wrong when it comes to confronting someone? There sure is. Verse 19. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may appear. It's not enough that you just confront someone on their sin. Don't think, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing a good thing because I've confronted you. No, just confronting them doesn't mean you are good or you are right because of the act of confrontation. Confrontation is only good when it's done in a good way. Confrontation is only right when it's done in a righteous way. What is the righteous method of confrontation? The Bible tells us here in verse 19, especially when directed towards a spiritual leader, a pastor. Verse 19, against an elder. Here it is definitely pastor. Against an elder, against a pastor, do not listen to an accusation. Do not even hear any negativity about the pastor unless it is before two or three witnesses. Now, does that mean that you as an individual should not gossip about the pastor unless there's three of you? So if there's three of you and there's two or three witnesses, then you may all gossip about the pastor. You're good because it's you and two witnesses. So everyone's all right. Is that what that means? I'm glad I hear you laughing. That makes me happy to hear that. If you would shake your head, yes, I would have seriously been concerned. (laughs) What's going on when I'm not around? So what it means is he's saying you, Timothy, are the pastor. He was not the only pastor. There were other pastors. He's saying, Timothy, as a leader of the church, do not even uh, give opportunity for a pastor to be shamed in front of the church, to, be, uh, to have his sin said in front of the church, unless there's more than one person who's willing to witness that wrong. Meaning this, as a church, which would for us be in a business meeting, So practically speaking, in a business meeting, and by the way, our Constitution is already laid out this way. That's one of the first things I did when I became a pastor, was I put in our Constitution, and we voted on it, the proper way to handle confronting the pastoral staff, because it was not in there. But as a church, in a business meeting, if there ever came a need to confront me or one of my pastoral staff over a wrong that we refused to get right, the church should not even give an opportunity for that wrong to be heard unless there's at least two individuals who can stand up and say, I have seen witness of this wrong and it is not being righted. Righted? It's not being fixed. How about that? This wrong is not being fixed. Folks, we often put too much weight on just one person's testimony, one person's account. You say, well, could the person not be telling the truth? Of course they could be telling the truth, but guess what else they could be doing? They could be lying as well. And now it's a he said, she said scenario. And when it comes to God's pastoral staff, he says, give the pastoral staff the benefit of the doubts. Do not assume right away that all the spiritual leaders are in sin and one accusation is enough to get them out of the church. God says, once I've allowed someone to be set up as a spiritual leader in the church, if a wrong does need to be confronted, and if they refuse to right that wrong, and if the church has to deal with it, make sure as a church that you give that pastor all of the righteous confrontation you can provide, which must include more than one witness. So letter A, 
All believers, especially pastors, should be innocent until proven guilty. I believe all believers, but definitely pastors, because that's what this verse is talking about in 19, elders, the pastoral staff, they should be assumed innocent until proven guilty. And that is about as righteous as a judgment as you can offer someone. And praise the Lord, that is currently how our American government still operates. Sometimes I'm concerned exactly where that will end up. But as of today, we are officially still innocent until proven guilty. So if the world, if a secular government can understand that truth, why can't the church understand that truth? And you say, Pastor Russ, well, I do understand the truth. Well, again, I don't want to talk about gossip and death because I'm not seeing that as a problem in our church. But I want to remind you, that's basically what gossip is. Gossip is assuming one's guilt while not even proving if they're innocent or not. Rather than the opposite of what it should be, righteous confrontation, going to the person themselves, and if they must be confronted, then more than one witness, at least two, assuming their innocence before their guilt. Letter B, feelings are not enough to condemn a believer of wrongdoing. Feelings are not enough to condemn a believer of wrongdoing needs to be at least two individuals and do not even receive an accusation unless there is a witness. It cannot be, I feel like that person needs to be confronted, so I'm going to do it. I feel like they need to leave the church, so let's get them out of here. No, that's not enough. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes all we have to go off of is what? Feelings. Would you admit that there's people who can be pretty tricky with what they do, are pretty good at hiding things, and you have this gut feeling that they're not who they seem to be. Anyone, you know, don't, don't raise your hand, but anyone kind of dealt with people like that? And then lo and behold, what happens? You were right. <laughs> your feelings were right. Yeah, your feelings nailed it. Your gut was spot on. That person wasn't who they seemed to be. And so that, when that happens more than once, eventually you are tempted to start doing something, which is what? And let's be honest. Your feelings are right. No one else saw it. Your feelings were right, no one else saw it. Your feelings are right, no one else saw it. Next time you have feelings and no one else sees it, what are you going to say? I'm right. Why? Because my feelings nail it every time. Let's be honest. Do they really nail it every time? You know, oftentimes we think that our feelings are some kind of like uh, magical, uh, you know, genie that tells us th some things that no one else knows. But if we were to be honest, there's a lot of times where our feelings were also wrong about ourselves and others. Those times we conveniently forget. And when we're told, oh, you're wrong, well, you know, no one's ever right all the time. You know, we just excuse it and move on with life, right? But boy, we remember every time our feelings were right. It's like there's a calendar. We mark it on the list or, you know, we, we etch it in stone and hang it on our wall so that we can point it out to our spouse. See, on March 14th, 2005, my feelings were right. So you know I'm right again today, right? And we always bring these things back up when our feelings were correct while failing to recognize the times our feelings were wrong. The truth is, you can't know when your feelings are right or wrong, but I do recognize there, there is something as an intuition. There is something as a, I just feel something's off here, but God's word says that's not enough to do anything. Let me tell you, there's been times as a pastor where people have come to me and said, I feel like there's a problem with something. And I said, can you, sh can you tell me Give me evidence, give me proof that your feelings are correct. And then they say, no, I just feel like this is the case. I said, there's nothing I can do with your feelings. I'm sorry. In at least one case, guess what? Their feelings are right, and I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, their feelings nailed it. Did I make the wrong decision? Should I have said, you know what, your feelings are enough for me, let's take care of that right now. Because once you go down that road, where does it end? Look, I regret, I'm not going to tell you who it was and what it was involved, but I regret, I regret that I didn't see it. I regret that, um, that, that there wasn't evidence for me to do something about it. And I regret that all I had to go off was, was feelings, and unfortunately, yeah, the feelings were right. I regret that. But in the end, all I did was follow God's word. God says two or three witnesses who can give specific evidence. It can't just be someone's feelings, especially about the pastors. Letter C, sin left unconfronted, and unrebuked will only bring shame and discouragement to God's people. If we do not confront the sin, if we do not challenge the sin in God's family, we are the ones who will be shamed. We are the ones 
who will be rebuked by God. And through that shame and rebuke, I promise you, we're going to be discouraged. Why are so many churches living in discouragement? Because so much sin is left unchecked within the church. It's going to result in discouragement. Verse 20, once you have confirmed that there is a wrong in the life of a believer, especially a pastor, who will not get it right, who will refuse to repent, verse 20, there's only one thing left you can do. Only one. And what is that? Sin, them that sin, rebuke before all. It does not mean quietly the pastor exits the church and never seen again. Now, very likely, most pastors in their right mind will not allow you to rebuke them before all, especially if they're unrepentant sinners. They're going to leave. It doesn't mean you have to bring the guy up and, you know, uh, sit him in the seat of shame and, and throw rocks at him as you all rebuke him. But it does mean the church needs to be aware of what happened. Again, chances are that pastor will no longer be there. If the guy's unrepentant, I mean, if I'm living in unrepentant sin, you confront me on it. I said, I'm not going to take care of it. And I'm that rebellious. I'm not going to come and let you make fun of me or, or let you tell the church what I've done wrong. I'm probably just going to leave is what I would do. I'm not doing that, nor would I. I'm just telling you, if I was a man in that position, that's what I would do. So very few chances would you ever find that a pastor is rebuked publicly before the church while he's still there. But if that pastor has the audacity to be in a position of spiritual leadership and unrepentantly refuse to get that sin taken care of, that, that pastor deserves every bit of shame that they get when a deacon or another pastoral staff gets up before the church and says, unfortunately, our pastor is no longer the leader of our church. They have refused to get this sin taken care of, and you are being told this so you're aware and also so that you understand the severity of this sin. That's what Paul says. In verse 20, what's the point of rebuking them before all? It's not to shame the individual. It's to strike fear, a healthy respect for sin, into the lives of those who hear. You know what Proverbs says? The book of Proverbs tells us that the one purpose of correcting the wrongs of a foolish, sinful individual is to help the simple, those who are kind of like, I'm not sure which direction I want to go. Do I want to serve God? Do I not want to serve God? Do I love God? Do I not love God? They're kind of unsure. You rebuke this person so that others will learn from their mistakes. Because chances are the fool will not learn. The Bible tells us, you know, the fool stiffens their necks and uh, their neck. And the harder you rebuke them, the, you know, the, the more resilient they become to your rebuke. So your rebuke of a fool isn't for the fool's benefit. Your rebuke of the fool is for the benefit of those who are watching. When a pastor has been found to live in sin and does not right that wrong, for the benefit of the church, that sin must be brought out and stated why that pastor is no longer in leadership. It should not be a quiet exit. If that pastor is going to wrong the church, the church should be told how they were wronged. And then number three, unbiased confrontation. Verse 21, our last verse for today. Charge thee, Paul says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one another before, or without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. This entire text was dealing with two things. One was confrontation, the other was widows. And so we're seeing that Paul is saying, don't be partial in the manner in which you challenge sin, and don't be partial in the manner in which you help the widows. Now we're going to forego the widows today. I said that's a separate message, and let's deal with the partiality or the bias that often comes with confrontation when, it de when we're dealing with pastors or just general church members. So, We've seen loving confrontation, righteous confrontation, now number three, unbiased confrontation. The best kind of judge is one who does not have a connection with the one who is being tried. In fact, did you know you are not legally allowed to sit on the jury of a trial if you have a connection with the person who is being tried? There have been trials who a juror lied and said, I do not know this person. I have no connection with that guy or girl. And it was found out after the fact the juror did know them, and it became a what? Mistrial. And that person got to go through the process all over again with fresh jurors. 
because the state of Amer uh, United States of America does not allow you to judge someone if you know them personally. Now, here's the problem. That doesn't work in the church, right? We can't judge those we don't know. We know each other. So it doesn't work how it should. But I will tell you this. The benefit of having 12 men or women on a jury at your trial is hopefully there's no bias when they decide if you're right or wrong. That's the end goal. That's what the United States government is trying to give every person, an unbiased opportunity of judgment. So the Bible tells us in a church, God wants the same thing for us. God also wants us to have as best opportunity as we can provide an unbiased judgment on one another. So we see here in verse 21, I charge thee before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, observe all these things that I've given you, but do it without preferring one another, one over the other, and do it without partiality. What is partiality? That's bias. That's saying, I like you, so I'll let you get away with more. I don't like you, so I'm going to let you get away with less. Uh, you're better than this person, so you can do more than this person. You're worse than this person, so you better not even try half of what this person does, because you won't survive in this church if you do. Now, bias is often given or received in one of two ways that I find in the church. The first way would be someone's financial ability, how much they have or how much they give to the church. Those who give a lot to the church can often get away with more. The second way bias comes is not one's financial ability, but one's what seems to be spiritual ability. Basically, the one who presents themselves as a more spiritual Christian. The one who says, I've been here longer. I've done more for God. I was a bus captain. I was a deacon. I was all these things. And so I basically racked up all these points, and I can, si I can, I can spend these points as I want to in sin. And I can trade my, my good points for my sin points, and you can't do anything about it. So one is the, 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 what seems to be the, the saint, which they can't be if you're having to confront them on sin, right? But that's what it seems to be. And the other one is money. They're basically buying their way through church. Let me tell you something. In the end, unless I'm the one doing the wrong, ultimately, the wrongs of the church fall on whose shoulders? Mine. And what I as pastor choose to do with them. And there is one very big reason why I will never count the money for this church. There's one extremely large reason why I will never be in that office to see who ties and who doesn't and how much you tithe and how much you don't. Because I do not ever want my judgment of you as a person to be biased by your checkbook. You can say, well, Pastor Russ, you know, even if you do how much I give, it shouldn't bother you because you should know I don't have that much money. Look, yeah, should, should, should. I totally agree with you. I'm only human. And I may know you don't have as much, you can't give as much. You have more, so you give more. I may know that, and I may say it's not necessarily a sin thing because those who have more give more, those who have less give less. I get it. But then I may be tempted to say, well, but if this person leaves, what are they taking with them? What are they taking with them? Their money. And the temptation for me as a pastor would be to, what can we do to make it so they don't leave? And I can honestly tell you, I have no clue in this room who gives and who doesn't. I have absolutely no clue how much you give and how much you don't give. So I can tell you, to the best of my ability, if it ever comes to a point where I have to confront you on a sin, it will not be biased based off of your checkbook. Letter A, the purity of the church must be a priority of the church. It has to be a priority. Paul says, I challenge you before God and the elect angels, this has to happen. Please make this a priority in your church, Timothy. Do not let the local church go down the path of impurity and destruction. Do not bring shame on God's kingdom. Do not bring shame on the local church by allowing sin to go unchecked. The purity of the church has to be a priority. So many people, they look at the leadership and say, how dare you confront that sin? How dare I not confront that sin, right? How dare you deal with that person and now they're no longer in our church? If you just would have let things slide, they never would have left. Look. Our church is not our church. Our church is God's church. And I'm only doing what God wants me to do. And God wants me, to the best of my unbiased ability, to, lead, to make sure sin does not go unchecked within this local body of believers. Letter B, our love for a pastor must not result in blindness towards sin. You, we often think of 
biased judgment in a negative way. Like, if it's biased, it's always going to be against us. Like, well, if it's biased, that means I'm out of here because they're not going to let me get away with anything. You know what actually ends up being in the church? That may be in the world that biased judgment often turns to, you're out of luck, Joe, you're out of here. In the church, it often ends up being, you can do whatever you want. Biased judgment in the church tends towards people get away with everything, especially who? The church leaders, especially the church leaders. I'm very bothered by how churches do politics in the church. I'm very bothered by how church leaders are way to get, uh, able to get away with so much because they're not following God's word. Paul says, don't be biased one way or the other, either against or for especially against your pastors, do not let them get away with everything just because you love them and just because of your pastor. You should love them, but that means because you love them, you have the freedom to confront them, not the fear to confront them. And then let her see and we're done. There is absolutely no amount of service that could ever be performed that would justify unrepentant sin. There is nothing that I could ever do as a pastor that would make it okay for me to live in unrepentant sin. And if I ever bring that up and say, well, why would you call me out on this? Look at all the things that I've done in the past. You need to say, Pastor Russ, there's no amount of right that ever justifies wrong. Just say that to me, okay? If one of my pastors ever says, look, think of all the good things I've done. You say, it doesn't matter. There's no amount of good that ever justifies any amount of bad. That's not how life works especially not how Christianity works. Do not be biased in your judgment towards good or towards bad. You need to, as the best of your ability, step outside of your opinion and say, is there facts? Are there evidence? Have the people come forward? Have they done so honestly? Is the person refusing to get it right? Then there must be a consequence. And God's word gives us that consequence if it's a pastor, rebuke before all. Folks, we have to stop living comfortable lives of don't ask, don't tell. I don't see what I just saw. We have to recognize that decision shames God's church. This is God's family. This is God's church. You are living God's testimony. Are you bold enough not to go looking? No one wants that. I don't want that. God doesn't ask for that. We're not looking for problems, because if you do, you'll find one. Don't look for them. But when they are brought to you, do not run from them. And please, do not bring them to anyone else but the person who is attached to that problem.